All right. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. It's good to see this many people here tonight. Uh, we did this class uh, last fall. Uh, that's how we ended out the year. We usually do a, um, we used to call it Tuesday University because it used to be Tuesday nights. And uh, every fall and every spring we do classes. And this was our last class last year. <laughs> but with the, uh, the starting of a Wednesday night uh, service that we're going to do, which is completely, some people, I guess, at least one person is confused about it. <laughs> um, this is going to be a, a Wednesday night service every week. Uh, we, I wanted to kick it off with this class again because I think this class is so important and we've got a bunch of new and different people in the church now. And not only, not, I shouldn't say this class is important, it's crucial. This class is crucial to our understanding of interpretation of Scripture and how we interpret it. Uh, the second reason I want to kick it off with this is because the way uh, I'm going to be going through, we are going to be kicking it off with the book of Matthew, uh, the way I'm going to be going through it, uh, once you go through this class, you're going to see, uh, as, as I go through uh, the sermon, you're going to see how this was done. You'll be like, yeah, yeah, he did it this way, and he used that tool and, and this method. Uh, last class we had, we had more people than we ever had in any class. I think we had 32. Um, and not only was it the most people, but usually... 30 people will start, and by the time you're done, there's about 12. You know, we started out with like 20-some and ended up with 32. And there were some stoked people during this. And I, I mean, they were using the tools and, and telling me what they were doing with it. And that stokes me up. When I, because this, I'm not just up here to, to feed people. Um, I'm up here to give you tools to utilize yourself. And hopefully that's why you're here. You're eager, eager to learn and you want to know more. I don't know everything. Um, I, you know, I've been in school for 13 years now. I'm, I'm still in school. Some people go through seminary for two years, four years. I've been in seminary for 13. Um, I started out learning this stuff. I started teaching this stuff, and, and I'm still under the tutelage of, of Pastor Mike and, and still going through all kinds of schooling and, and books and everything else. And, and I, you know, it's, it, it, if you're anything like me, it's like the more you learn, the less you know, right? <laughs> and yet you have even more questions. And the minute we stop being teachable and we think that we got it down, that we, that we know it all, um, you're of no use to anybody, especially the Lord, okay? And, and we certainly can't use you here. We don't want egotistical, prideful. We're going to be starting 1 Corinthians. You're going to learn all about a prideful church. And this is when divisions start and everything else because you ain't got nothing to, to, to learn. You think you know it all. So this is a very important class, and... We're going to be going through it fast because it used to be a five-week deal. I cut it down into four. I'm trying not to use all these big words because I don't like big words, but sometimes you can't help it, so there will be a few. I think I made the uh, notes for you guys pretty easy to follow along. Some of the stuff is going to be on the, the uh, PowerPoint. So there are uh, clipboards um, in almost all the, at least a couple of them in each row. So if you want clipboards, Go ahead and grab one. I really want you guys to take notes. And um, these are not going to be video recorded, but we will have the audio of these classes only because I want people to miss um, to have access to that so they can go back to it. Or if you just want to go back and, and you know, reiterate something that we went through and like, what was that one thing? Well, we can go back. Right now, our audio or our uh, Soundboard guy is on vacation, or not vacation, he's down in Iowa and won't be back until Wednesday, so we won't have this up until after then. Um, so, stoked about this, and I would love if somebody would kick us off with, with prayer tonight. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Now, even though we're seated like this and we're not sitting around a table like we normally do, um, just like I say in the services too, man, I, I want you guys to, to speak. If you need to speak, ask questions, stop me. Okay? If, if, I, if I'm, I want to finish out what I was saying, I'll get back to you, but please do not hesitate to ask questions, all right? That's what this is about tonight. It's about you learning. It's not about just me up here blabbering like I do on Sundays. <laughs> so, 
we're going to start out with just a question um, of why do we need tools and methods? Why do we need to learn about Bible interpretation? And that's a question. Okay, and I want to repeat some so people on the audio can hear, but she said to understand the root of some of the words and, and what they're saying there. I think context is really important. You have to understand the context of what you're reading because anybody can take any given aspect of the Bible and if it's out of context, yes. they're really whacked, whacked out and not making any sense. Context is very important. If you don't have context, it's whacked out and don't make no sense. You said it right there. And we'll have one of our classes, and most of it's going to be about context. I never know where to start. Where to start? What, what book to start with? Right. Especially if you're a new believer, like, yeah. <laughs> well, I started out like you're supposed to in a book, right, in the beginning, and it just don't make any sense, and uh, what is all this, and what's this got to do with Jesus? Right. I think also relating it to um, everyday life now. Relating it to everyday life now, which is one of the problems that I think we have in our church culture and our Bible study culture is that we have a tendency to do that and negate the rest of it. And we go right to the Bible and do the worst thing you can ever do in life and say, blah, 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 here's what this means to me. No. We don't do that until, we can do that, but not until we understand context and all the other things. Then we, once we have that understanding and we're going to go through all that, then we can go to it and say, okay, now that we understand that, how can I apply that to my life today? What is the application for us in what Paul said or in what uh, Moses said? Basically, for me, I try to figure out who's writing it. Who's writing it? Why did he write it? Who is he writing it to? Um, what period of time did he write it? Yep. And um, then you just go from there. Who's writing it? Why are you writing it? What period of time? And go from there, and that's... That's, that's kind of one of the cool things about some study Bibles is they usually give you the, the histor historical context and all that in it. And, and yeah, that's very important. If, you, if, you, if you've been here a while, so you know whenever I start a new book, usually the very first message is either all or mostly introduction and introducing when the book was written, who wrote it, what, what was the historical context, why was it being written. Um, all that is very important stuff before we even start getting into the book. get the proper meaning out of the text, which is the context. So I think a lot of people, um, you know, it's like, do we really need all this stuff to read the Bible? They didn't have this stuff back then. And, you know, it's like, do we really need it? Doesn't the Bible just speak for itself? And them are good questions. Them are valid questions, right? Because not everybody has the opportunity to have all these tools and stuff like that, and, and so how do, you, how do you answer a question like that? It's like, well, yes and no, right? So I want to start out tonight by uh, going to, like we always should do with things, yes, Brian Cole wears glasses. <laughs> I don't have my, <laughs> my big print Bible uh, for the, the, the one I'm using tonight. So I want you to open up, let's just look at a couple verses, that's how I want to start it out, why it's important, because it's important because the Bible says it's important, all right? So we go to the Bible for everything. So if you want to open your Bibles up to 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 15. And there's all kinds of verses we could go to, but I, I specifically picked out three to kind of start with. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just want to kick it off with what the Bible says about why it's important for us. First, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 I bought a really expensive Bible a few uh, last year, uh, pure you know pure leather, and they had this really cool thing on it and all that. Had it, had it uh, uh, what do you call it, tooled in and all that. <laughs> I get the thing, and it's like the same size print as on one of those little those little Bibles. Oh my gosh, hundred some dollars, and I can't even really I can't even really read it. I have yeah, I got to wear glasses for that one for sure. And I was like, I'm gonna. And make it, yeah, well, that's the bottom part, right? <laughs> All right, everybody got it? Anybody not got it? Okay, we'll wait for our sister here, Second Timothy. It's, it's really easy to find. It's right after First Timothy. <laughs> I still have 
Yeah, please, if you, if you have somebody you see is struggling with finding these, please help them. We don't all, we don't all know where this stuff is at. <laughs> and for those people that don't, I really highly recommend the Go Fish Guys Bible song. It will help you uh, memorize the scriptures. Really? Yeah. I've never heard of that. Oh, Go Fish Guys are awesome. Huh. I learned about them at a BBS one year I helped with, and it was, oh, they're awesome. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, verse 15. Do your best. Let me stop right there. How many of you in here hunt? You guys, for sure. <laughs> do you do your best when you hunt? Amen. Oh, what do you hunt? Mostly. Everything but mostly... Okay, dear. So how much time do you do your best and how much time do you spend in actually setting up the stand, learning where the deer are, tracking them, setting up the camera, buying corn? You do your best. When you go out and you hunt, you do your best. You spend money doing it. And, and, and that can be said for any of us, a hobby that we're involved with or whatever. When, when it says do your best, how much more so for the scriptures do you think we should be doing our best? We spend all this time and money on these, these worldly things that we do, not saying they're wrong, but man, if you took even half that time to do your best studying the Scriptures, so it's right away it starts out, do your best to what? To present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So, we are to rightly handle the word of truth, unashamedly, unabashedly, doing our best. That little verse right there says a lot. And we, I could do a whole sermon on that, but I think it speaks for itself. That's re reason number one why they study the scriptures. And we should do our best and do it unashamedly. The second scripture, let's look at 2 Peter. Yeah, I'm having you, this goes back a little bit even further. It's after Hebrews. Second Peter chapter three and verse sixteen. Now, if we were all using the same Bible under the seats when someone gets to it, we usually call out the page number. <laughs> Sometimes that helps me. <laughs> Three, sixteen, and seventeen. Now, uh, th uh, this is Peter, and he's talking. He's referencing Paul here. So he's talking about Paul. Wait till you got that guy, brother. As he does in all Paul, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Well, thanks for that, Peter, because, man, it ain't it? And some stuff, I mean, the essential stuff is not really hard to understand, but there are things that are hard to understand. I, I saw, I, I have a whole lot of respect for seminary teachers, especially in their 70s and 80s and just retiring. And you ask them a question or you see a question asked to them online somewhere, and they're like, I ain't got no clue. <laughs> you know, that's humility. And like some of the stuff you come across in here, like when the Bible is talking about praying to the dead, you know, it's like, what are they talking about? And got a, a 70 some year old seminary teacher retired. He's like, I, I have no clue. He could tell you the 30 different reasons people give for what that means, but he's I ain't got no clue. Some of these things are hard. And it says some, uh, some, in, in, some things in them are hard to understand. Here's the key, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. Now that's powerful. The ignorant twist these things, and they not only twist them, but it's to their own destruction, and possibly the destruction of the person that they're teaching this junk to. So there's a right way, and there's a wrong way, okay? And not everything is easy to understand. The last one I want to take you to is this one's a little easier to find, Matthew, which we will be getting into after this class. Oh, man, I'm so excited about that. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and you can just write this in your notes. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. 
I'm just going to look at verse 5 and 6 here. Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to go on to verse 5. And this is when the, the, the devil is tempting Jesus here, one of the times. In verse 5, it says, And the devil took him, Jesus, to the holy city, sent him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and here he's quoting Psalms, He will command his angels concerning you, and more quotes of the Bible, on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. Now I want you to see that because like uh, we just looked at in, in Peter there, even the devil knows Scripture. Even the devil can quote Scripture, but he's misquoting it. And just like it said in Peter, to their destruction. So, yeah, it, the devil's using Scripture. To, anybody can use Scripture, but we don't always use it right. And I tell you what, man, my, my job, and I say that because, man, I, I don't see this as a job, but my job, I take it very seriously. And when the Bible tells me that I'm going to be held to higher standards, that scares the hell out of me, literally. I am responsible to shepherd a flock, and that scares me. Now, and this is one of the reasons why I always tell people, man, don't, don't trust what I'm telling you up here on Sundays and now Wednesday nights. Go look for it yourself. Be a good Berean and check the scriptures for yourself because I'm a human being and I err and I get, I get things wrong. I mean, there's times I'll, I'll, I'll be sitting back and, and putting a sermon together and think about something I wrote two years ago in another sermon. I'm like, oh, man, I really messed that up. Well, how do you go back and fix that? So it's a scary thing. But that's how any of us should feel about handling the very Word of God itself. So very important, man. The Bible does speak for itself, but if there's, if there's anything that we need to be doing our best in, it's doing our best to learn the Scriptures ourselves so we're able to present them, whether it's our family or a sermon, to everybody else in a, in a proper manner that's contextual with what's going on in the Scriptures. So... I'm going to start getting into a couple things here. I'm going to try and fly through some of this. Uh, again, that's why I made your notes uh, so well, <laughs> so you're not sitting there writing the whole, scribbling the whole time. The nature of the text and the reader really leaves us with a need for interpretation and good observation skills in order to properly understand the text. For example, Bible authors uh, very often wrote specific things to a church in the letters that are written. Like we're going to be starting 1 Corinthians after we're done with Exodus here. So next month we'll be in 1 Corinthians. And that's a very specific text to a specific church. And I believe uh, maybe a couple of you might even uh, have been here when we ended with um, Revelation. We started with Exodus. I showed a video that the, basically the video was, guess what? The Bible wasn't written for you. Did that surprise you? It wasn't written for you. It wasn't. It was written by people for other people during that time for a specific reason. Yeah, it was written for us, but it wasn't. And so we have to understand that these are specific letters and, and epistles and historical documents and stuff for another people in another time. Yes, it applies to us, but we got to understand this before we can apply that to us. Because uh, if we're unaware of specific issues addressed by the Bible's author, then how are we going to know how to apply the text? If we don't know who, what they were talking about, who they were talking to, why it was written, how are we going to be able to say, okay, well, this is how it applies to me, when we don't even know how it applies to them? Number three, there's idioms and expressions in the scriptures that don't always translate well. And we use these study tools to understand the meaning behind these idioms that we see in the Bible. Now, idiom is really just an expression that has a meaning other than what the words themselves communicate. For example, man, I really, I really got my hands full this week, right? Well, my hands aren't literally full, but that's an idiom. And there's a lot of them in Scripture. And if we don't understand that's an idiom, how are we going to apply that to ourselves? Here's an example. 
Why would James in Acts 15 ask believers to abstain from eating food contaminated by idols and eating blood? Why do you think he said that? Well, how do we apply that to us? You don't even know what it means then. You need to look at the historical context, and, and we'll be doing that in, in 1 Corinthians because there was some, some food stuff going on there, right? Food, 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 food for the idols. So we're going to really be getting into the context there and going through Corinthians so you'll have a little better understanding uh, once we go through that. But there's a, there, this is a specific context in, when, in, in which James gives this command. And knowing the background of this text, it will tell us whether this abstinence from eating blood is for back then or for us now. And in between that is called timeless truths. And there's a lot of that in scriptures. That's, that's why we have so many cults or even, even really faithful believers who are using cultic practices. And, and I'm not saying that in a really bad sense, but when, and if you really want to get into this, man, we start our, uh, our uh, theology program back up again, we'll be getting into great detail, detail about this stuff. But the timeless truth is like with the headdress thing, okay? We have straight whole sects out here that live a certain way and, and present themselves a certain way because they ripped it right from the pages of the Bible from back then and say, okay, this is how we have to do this now because that's what they did. Well, was that a timeless truth? Has it always been that way? So we have to understand these things or that's what's going to end up happening to us. We're going to have these, uh, these uh, judgmental, bigoted beliefs because that's what the Bible says with no understanding about what it meant. Well, does it even apply to you? And this leads us into the reasons why we study theology. Does anybody know what theology means? What's that? I heard a mumble. Study of the word. Study of the word. Theology is basically what you believe about God or what you believe about the Bible. And everybody has theology, even an atheist. They don't believe in God. That's a theology. That's their belief about God. They don't believe in it. Well, why do we need theology? The truth is that every person in the world is a theologian. Everyone has beliefs and statements that they have about God and, and His church. Beliefs about God and His church is theology. Therefore, everyone is a theologian, whether they know it or not. And guess what? It's better to be a good theologian than a poor, uninformed one. All right? And it's the same with being a, a, a translator of the Bible. We're all translators of the Bible. But you're either a good translator or a bad translator. Okay? We all have worldviews and presuppositions, and we carry them into our reading of the Bible. All right? We need a process by which we can look at the, a Bible passage objectively and then apply it to our current context. So this whole course is designed to help us with the skills and the knowledge and give us a base that will help us with our theological beliefs. Okay? But before we start getting into the methods and inter uh, interpretation of God's Word and context and all that, I want us to start tonight by looking at basically the Bible itself and what exactly is the Word of God. Now, God's Word is God's revelation of Himself and His requirements uh, to, and promises to mankind. And what is the means of communicating God's Word? Well, 2 Peter 1.20, but know for this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, we all have a lot of Bible verses memorized, maybe. How about this one? <laughs> Please, make this part of your memorization. People don't want to know that because people want to be able to be ignorant to this, so they can interpret the Bible any way they want, Okay. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God revealed himself, his will, and his commands uh, to the prophets and the apostles, and they recorded that which was revealed. True prophets back then had to uh, pass a test of a prophet, Guess what? And if you didn't, you died. You were killed. All right? And likewise, the, the apostles had to pass a test of apostleship. Now, not everyone who claims to be a prophet is a prophet. All right? Imagine that. Having a word of knowledge or a word of prophecy is different than holding the office 
of a prophet. We no longer have the office of a prophet. We still have the gift of prophecy, which is a word, but where there is no longer an office of prophecy. Now, how much of God's word is inspired? We say that, but we see so many churches that obviously don't believe that. I mean, we have even up anywhere around here, really, but we have rainbow flags up in cable. How does that align with Scripture? And we have, we have churches over uh, next door to us or whatever around here that uh, teach that hell doesn't, isn't real. Well, how does that line up with Scripture? If you believe that all the Bible is inspired, well, I'll tell you why. Because these seminaries and stuff nowadays, and so many of these denominations are slipping away from that. They believe that the Bible is inspired, but not all of it. And see, now, now we come into some really dangerous stuff because who's, who's the one that's going to tell us what's inspired and what isn't? And this is where we really slip on the Word of God, and this is where the churches fall. But scholars speak of plenary, infallible, and inspiration. Plenary means all. It means all of God's Word is inspired. Infallible means that God never fails in the transmission of His Word and will, and inspiration means God breathed. Uh, or God's word is uh, spirit inspired. It wasn't like, you know, Paul was sitting there, oh, oh I'm going to close my eyes, oh, and let, let the Lord through the Holy Spirit write this. What did he say to me? No, man. God used that man through the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted him to write. Now, I want to talk about Bible translations. This is going to be a big one. And I hope I... I, I, I should put my email up because usually every week um, I try my best to offend at least one person, okay? And uh, you, can, you can email me anytime you want. But now, if you've ever heard of uh, the, the original copies of the scriptures that the apostles and Moses and all of them themselves wrote, they're called autographs. Now, we have no autographs, okay? We have copies of the autographs, but we have no autographs. Matter of fact, in the Old, uh, New Testament alone, we have over 30,000 different copies of the New Testament from ancient writings. Uh, even with all those copies and those, those original documents, we could still have a whole Bible if we just took all the writings of the first and second century uh, priests and, and apostles and stuff like that. If we took all their, their, their writings that they, they wrote down from the scriptures, we'd have a whole Bible in itself. We don't even need those original documents. So... The autographs in the Bible were written in, in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Thus, the only word-for-word, -word, letter for letter, perfect texts are the originals. Okay? Y'all agree with me with that? That is the only original. That's the only thing that is 100 percent inspired, and nobody can change that. All right? If you're looking, what's that? No human error, well, not from the originals, not from the autographs. Now, the originals were messed with a little bit, okay? But if you're looking for a translation of a Bible that conveys every single period and every single comma exactly as it was given in the original, you will not find that in the English or any other language for that matter, okay? What many people fail to understand, especially the King James only people, okay? Oh, it really ticked me off. I, I love them, though. But if you're looking for a translation that conveys word for word, jot for jot, jit for jit, exactly, you're never going to find it. All Bible translations are translations. And I had an argument. Uh, not an argument. This KJ only person was trying to get me into that sect. And I was like, no, man. And I, I you know, he gave me a, a like a folder full of material proving this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, he got upset with me because I didn't, did you read it? And I'm like, no, man, I know, I know where I stand in that. I know enough in my 13 years that, again, I'm teachable, but I know what I know about this. Well, how can you say it? I said, well, look at man. Is not the King James Version a translation from the original documents? That means it's translated. It's a version. It's, no, that ain't the way it is. When you're so set in something even the truth cannot defer you from your belief. 
every Bible translation is a translation, okay? Unless you got the original documents in front of you. Because when you start understanding the, uh, just a plethora of, of words in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic, that you know, one word can mean 20 different things in the English. Well, who decides which one of those to use? Even in the King James Version. It's a version. It's a translation. Once you translate the original language into any other language, it's a translation. And it's a translation because of the difficulty of interpreting the original language into any other language. It's rough. Have any of you in here ever went into, your, uh, into keyword study Bibles and, and the Greek and the Hebrew and stuff like that and looked up? Yeah, there's a whole lot. I mean, you could have like a little mini book on one word and what it means. Well, it's a translation. And a question a lot of people ask is, what translation of the Bible should I use, <laughs> right? And uh, we're, we're to the point, I think, in our society and our ignorance in the church where we fight about everything. And I noticed in the last probably 8, 10 years, one of the things we've, we fight about not so nonsensically is the whole Easter and Christmas thing. Uh, we're at each other's throats on Facebook about this. Oh, they're cults and this and that. And it's like, come on, man, can't we just love each other and understand things, you know? I mean... We can go back and forth and back and forth about this. But it's the same as a Bible translation. People will straight fight you about what translation you should use because this is what I use. And that's not an easy answer because there's so many excellent editions of the Bible available. It just depends on how you want to read it. I found just personally, I think it's really interesting to have a few different yes. studies from. Yes, yes. Yes. But it does seem to offer a little bit more of a broader picture. Yeah, using different versions. Mark Twain, I think it was uh, Hail of the Frog, he wrote, and then some French guy like redid it or whatever, and then he redid it from what he redid it from. And then you can't even understand it because, you know, he's going off of, because you don't know French. You know, right. He's just translating it. And I, I thought that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. So some of the translations differ from others only in the style of its uh, format, and it really becomes a matter of literary preference. Uh, you know, what's easier for you, or you want more complicated stuff, or, or whatever. But there, there are some basic and notable differences in the translations that you do need to be aware of. And these differences really reflect the different procedures they have in preparing the translations. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of these different uh, mythologies that they use, and there's really three basic ones. The first one is called formal equivalence. And this method is used, this is the one that really seeks to follow the Greek text or the Hebrew text as closely as possible in a word-for-word -word fashion, okay? And even then, it's still a translation. They still got to figure out which words to use. But here, strict fidelity to the ancient language is stressed in a verbal way. And the strength of this method is obviously found in its verbal accuracy. But the weakness is, is uh, well, we're going to be using the NASB. Um, um, we use the ESV on Sunday mornings. But on Wednesday nights, starting in Matthew, we're going to be using the NASB. And you'll see why I'm going to be using the NASB. But the NASB is probably one of the best uh, translations out there as far as word for word yet still readable <laughs> all right but it, so it's cumbersome and it's kind of awkward at times and um, but it doesn't really a, a lot of a lot of the no not a lot there are, there are quite a few times where the, the 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 Hebrew or the Greek is really brought over into the English awkwardly they really don't know what to say so they kind of try to keep as close as they can to the original. Sometimes it don't make sense. So it makes it awkward, but you, you got accuracy is what you got there. But to translate any document from one language to another in this manner, it's going to make for difficult reading, okay? And the more accuracy you want, the more difficult it's going to get. And examples of this translation is, again, the NASB, which we're going to be using, and the New King James Version. Now, these translations are useful for when we get into study, but it's awkward for if you just want to sit down and read the Bible. I would not recommend those translations, okay? The second is formal, or, oh, uh, functional equivalence. And this, this method is also known as the dynamic equivalence. 
uh, and this is the predominant method used in modern translations, and it, and it seeks the maximum of fluid reading style with a minimal of verbal distortion. And since words put together, they, they do what? They produce thoughts and concepts, and the goal is to produce an accurate rendition of the thought or concepts in Scripture. And examples of these are, uh, can be found in the New Revised Standard Version and the NIV, the New International Version. The third one is called the paraphrase or free translation. And the paraphrase method is really an expansion of the functional equivalence method. And here this concept is extended and elaborated to make sure that it's, it's very well communicated. And there's, a, there's various different kinds of paraphrases. There's the J.B. Phillips translations, and that's really a classic form of the, the paraphrase. Uh, a more recent phenomenon is the modernized paraphrase, and you can see that in the New Living Translation, or the message. All right? And while both these versions use the, the Hebrew and Greek as their basis, the main purpose there is its readability and thought patterns. They expand way too much. Okay? You, you, you're really losing what the original authors meant in these kinds of translations, and I do not recommend these kinds of translations. Maybe somebody that, that has a, a, a reading deficiency in some way or maybe an autistic person or something like that, it would be easier for them to understand, but, but don't go there if, if you can't. But the more, because the more a translation moves from the direction uh, of the original content to a paraphrase, man, the more the danger of distortion of the scriptures there are there. And although a lot of the paraphrases have been helpful in Bible reading, they're not recommended for serious study, all right? In my personal opinion, uh, the weakest addition in this method is the Living Bible. But if you want a deeper overview of the history of the translation of the Bible, I gave you some copies and why different translation uh, philosophies are used and how different translations differ. There's a great book out there. I'm going to give you the title. It's Leland Riken's Choosing a Bible. And it's a great study on the translations that are available out there and, and uh, just a really good read. It's a good place to begin. But you can also go, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go on, on, on Amazon. <laughs> Not anywhere else. They don't even have Christian bookstores really anymore, man. They shut them all down. Leland, L E L A N D, Riken, R Y K E N. It's on, our sheet. it's on the sheet. There you go. Yeah. All right. So now let's move into translations and commentary. Again, in a sense, all translations are, of the Bible are commentary. All right. Do you understand that? If, if somebody translates something from the, the original language, they're making a commentary on that. They're saying what they think it should say. Every translation out there involves the process of deciding uh, or a decision of making uh, with respect to, to words and ideas, and thus you will never find a perfect translation unless you can read the original Greek and Hebrew. You will never find the perfect translation. Even those translations produ produced by a check and balance system, utilizing a whole team of scholars, which a lot of the scriptures do, like the NIV, that was a whole team of scholars, they still reflect uh, the individual or corporate bias of those individuals a lot of times, all right? Such bias frequently kept to a minimum, and you really don't have to worry about it or be alarmed by that, but you should be aware that there is, these are human beings, right? So there's going to be a frailty over any given translation because there's always going to be a bias there. Now, the RSV or Revised Standard Version, it really it deserved the widespread use it enjoyed, but the elements of liberal theology can be seen within that, if you really look for it. The NAST, or the American, New American Standard Translation, that, that has a conservative bent to it. There aren't reasons for, or these aren't reasons for outright a, a, a rejection of these translations, but these are just words of caution that you can't really overlook these tendencies when they, when they do these translations. Now, in 1998, an agreement was reached with the Division of Christian Education and the National Council of Churches of Christ in the United States to use the text of the RSV as the basis 
for a new evangelical translation. And a publishing team uh, produced the ESV, the English Standard Version, in 2001, which really was designed to be more literal than the NIV and more idiomatic than the NASB. But as good as it is, ESV too has its problems. <laughs> as New Testament professor D.A. Carson says, no translation is perfect. All right? So just keep that in mind. And no translation is perfect. Yeah, I use ESV. That's what I... It's still not perfect. I'm King James only. That's yeah, not perfect either. Oh, oh now, now they want to fight, though. <laughs> Let's talk about King James. I, I really... I, I, don't, I, I guess I kind of understand the King James Version cult, but I don't. I, 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 them guys are, I mean, they're cultish. They're way out there. And, and if you're in that sect, I'm sorry, but you're part of a cult. Uh, but anytime you have a translation like that that enjoys the predominant position that it's had over such a long period of time, there's bound to be a whole lot of protests when its position of honor is endangered, right? <laughs> Now, the NIV has outsold the King James Version since 1987, all right? And some have charged that to replace the King James Version is nothing less than the work of the devil, all right? That's how far they go. Others act as if it were verbally inspired translation, like I said with this guy. It's, it's inspired. It's not translated. You have straight King James cults all around us, and I'm sure you've seen them on Facebook. So it's not surprising to see such a reaction because of its longevity. The King James Version has been, uh, become precious to a lot of people, right? I mean, you read that King James Version, once you, under, once you understand the Bible a little better and you're in faith a little bit, then go read it. And it's beautiful. I mean, we don't talk like that anymore. I don't understand, right? What? They, they didn't talk like that back then either, in the, you know, in the first century. So how is that inspired? <laughs> but what translation could possibly match the majesty and the eloquence and the language style on the pages of the King James Version? I mean, have, have you ever had somebody read the King James Version to you that had an eloquent voice? It's beautiful. It's like listening to Hamlet or something, you know? But one fact concerning the King, the King James Version that we can't ignore it's simply less accurate in its representation than that of the original writings and that of the most recent um, modern translations that we have. It's less accurate, okay? And there's a crucial historical reason for this. Now, I want you to get this. The Greek text from which the King James Version was translated was called the Textus, Textus Receptus. And it's clearly inferior to more modern, reconstructed Greek texts. Many textual errors that are found in the King James Version have been eliminated from uh, more modern translations of the King James Version. But manuscript discoveries in, since the 16th century have greatly enriched our knowledge of the original text. Now, I'm going to pop up a uh, thing here, and some of you are going to instantly recognize this. Anybody instantly recognize this? You see on Facebook? You always see these posts people putting up with King James Version versus the, the NIV version and how NIV version is satanic because they take stuff out. All right? I want you to see this example to illustrate a point. Now, in the King James Version, we read the following words in 1 John 5, 7. For there are three, and this is, this is one that they use a lot, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, okay? That's taken from the, the, the King James Version. Now, these words provide clear and explicit reference to the Trinity, right? Now, such words really should put an end forever to the, the charge that the Bible doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity, all right? Now, I believe the Bible conveys the doctrine of the Trinity in many ways. And those of us who've been going through the Old Testament even, we've seen that over and over, right? And I believe the verses uh, quoted here, they're a true, that's a true statement, right? Yet many are convinced that John didn't pen those lines and they have no business being in this epistle. Okay, why? Because the overwhelming testimony of most of the manuscripts that we have, that is not in it. That does not appear in the earliest texts. 
Now, if we can pinpoint the accidental inclusion in the biblical text of any scribal gloss, this is the one, all right? These words, they were found in a 4th century manuscript, and it was incorporated by Aramaeus in his reconstruction of the Greek text in the 16th century. Now, the NIV... I'm sorry, I should have had that up there. Now, the NIV and the ESV, they render this accurately. They say, for there are three that testify. And now, this is, this is again, this is one of the things that you'll see on Facebook that they'll, the King James only people will fight about, saying, oh, the NIV is satanic because it's taken out the Trinity. Well, if we're looking for a beautiful translation, let me tell you something. The King James Version is it. But if we're in, in it for accuracy and purity in the biblical translation, you got to go beyond the King James Version because most of their stuff was written from later texts. And a lot of those later texts, there were things that were added to it. Now, in and out of itself, the, the stuff is still true, okay, but it's not accurate because it wasn't in the original documents. It was added later. Now, the New, Jim, the, the new King James Version is an attempt to answer the problems with the King James Version that are addressed and the preface to the New King James Version says this, a special feature of the New King James Version is its conformity to the thought flow of the 1611 Bible. Okay? Now, once you start reading that, you'll discover that the sequence and selection of the words and phrases and clauses of the new edition, yeah, they're a little bit clear, but they're so close to the traditional that there's a remarkable ease in listening to the reader of either edition while following with the other one. Now, one of the things that they did with the New King James Version is they took out all the beautiful literacy or the, the these and nows and the, the, the beautiful way it just flows and made it a little bit more accurate. Now, I wish it would have made it a lot more accurate and left that beautiful word, you know, the wording in there, man. But although the New King James Version, it retains that textus receptus as its primary Greek text, uh, it indicates variant readings from more modern reconstructions um, in the Greek text and in the footnotes. So um, I, I hope I made that enough that the, the King James Version, awesome version, but it, it used a text from more modern copies in, of the documents and not the earlier ones, which is, and, and I'll get into this a little bit more when I talk about this other uh, really awesome Bible here. But let me give you another example of this. Let's look at John 5, 4, and the angels stirred the waters, Right? For an angel went down a certain season of the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after trouble, the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had, or does he? You might be missing this in your version. Okay? You look at another version, it's not there. Usually when, when there is another version with something that's not there, they'll have a little footnote in the text as to why it's not there or just a, a, a little asterisk or something. That'll tell you that some other versions have this and some don't. You see, what we got to understand is that the angel that was stirring the waters, that was nothing but a local myth. And it was included in the marginal notes and eventually made its way into the text. So, it, it, again, look at some of your Bible translations. Some will have it in there, some won't. wasn't in the original text but it made its way into later documents. Again, not it's a bad thing. It, it was a local, uh, a local deal that was going on, and, and probably the copier was like, well, you know, let's add this in here because that was something that happened and what people believed. It's weird, it just skips it. It skips it, yeah, some just skip it because it wasn't in the text that they were going through. So a copy of John was sent to another church that wasn't aware of this local legend of the angels stirring the waters, and these newly discovered manuscripts help us to revise our Bible versions to more accurately represent the Greek text. So a lot of times you won't even have those things in your, in your text, and this is where the King James people will come in and they'll belt you over it. Oh yeah, you see what I'm saying? They're taking stuff out of your Bibles they don't want you to know about. But the original King James Version has, listen to this, 200,000 such errors. All right? Now, newer or more revised versions are more accurate to the original text because they have better manuscripts to look at. All right? The, the King James Version have four texts. 
that they used, while the newer versions have 30,000 manuscripts from which a translation can be made. So look at John 7, 53 through 8, 11. I want you to look that up in your Bibles. John 7, 53 through chapter 8, 11. <clears throat> Anybody have a King James Version that they're using in here? I, I brought my NKJV. Okay. But no, I, I don't do the deep, no. Okay. <laughs> and anybody have an NIV that they're using in here? All right. Uh, John 7, 53. 7, 53. Yeah, ain't a word. I've never seen that before. What do you have? Uh, you have ESV? The earlier script, yeah. yep. All manuscripts. Do not include 53 through 811. Okay. And what version do you have? CSV. CSV. CSV says the same. Okay. What's your NIV say? NIV, same thing. Same thing. What's the New King James Version say? 753. They have it? Every, and everyone went to his own house. Okay. Through 811. Through 811. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's That's it? 8, 1 through 11? No, it's in here. Okay. Yeah. So it, it is, but this what is... is an old Bible, though. Right. This has been around for... I just grabbed it because it had a Bible cover on it. Yeah. So some of you have it and some of you don't, but what does it mean that this story isn't part of the original writing? What, does that mean our Bible's flawed? See, you guys are already learning something in here tonight. So this issue often occurs because someone who made a copy of an original text remembered this event. It was a real event, right? And they wanted to make sure everybody knew about it. But these books were originally letters written to individual churches. Thus, the more information that the churches had, the better off they'd be, okay? <laughs> it's not the original, but it's probably an accurate rendition of what occurred, right? Remember, Jesus did a lot of things that wasn't recorded, okay? All right, so here I want to give you a solution to some of this stuff. <laughs> now, <clears throat> this just came up here again about a month and a half ago. I was invited to speak somewhere on uh, uh, demonic possession and stuff, evil and stuff like that. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I spoke about was um, <clears throat> in, in, the, in the book of Matthew uh, and, and in John, I believe, too, uh, when, when Jesus and a couple of his guys were coming down from the mountain, um, they came across this, this uh, little deal that was going on. And this dad and his son, they were arguing with the disciples, and, 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 and the son was, was demonized. He had demons in him. And, 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 and Jesus comes in, he's like, what's going on? What's all this gruff about? And they're like, well, my, my son is demon-possessed, and I'm asking your guys to do that. They can't, can't do nothing about it. And Jesus says, well, this kind can only be eradicated by prayer. And there was some guy out there that's like, prayer and fasting! I said, well, not in the original documents, but yeah, fasting was usually a given with the Jews, but that, that, that ain't what the original document said. Well, he wrote me the next day, well, I'm this, that, and the other thing, and blah, blah, blah. He wanted to argue about it. I'm like, listen, the newer or the, the older texts do not have that. It was added later. Now, if you look at your Bibles, that's another passage where some of you will have prayer and fasting, some of you will have just prayer. Now, here's a solution. Anytime you come across a text that is not in your Bible or you see some, you see some straight, literal garbage like this going up on Facebook, whenever texts are different than what uh, another person has or if there's something that's got the asterisk in your Bible saying not in the original documents, whatever, this is where this spectacular piece of literature comes into play. It's called the Net Bible. And you can go on Bible.org. Hopefully they still have them. There was one point when I did this class a few years back where they ran out and they just, this is actually a second edition now. Uh, but you can go to Net Bible. They're only about 25 bucks. But I tell you what, if you are really interested in, in, in this kind of stuff, this will be a lifesaver to you. Whenever I come across this, that, that kind of stuff on Facebook or somebody wants to argue with me about what's in my Bible and not in theirs and vice versa, this Bible is what you need. 
It's a completely new translation of the Bible, and it has 60,932 translator notes. It was completed by more than 25 scholars, experts in the original languages, who work directly from the best currently available Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts. All right? The translator's notes make the original language far more accessible, uh, allowing you to really look over the translator's shoulders at the very process of the translation, and it makes transparent the, the textual biases and the rationales for key renderings, including major interpretive options and alternative translations. Basically, what I'm saying is, if there's something different in Bibles or something missing in one and not in another, you can go to this, look up the verse, and it'll tell you why. What manuscripts they came from or didn't come from. Or you can just read this Bible and go through all the 60,000 notes and find out what's where, what shouldn't be where, what is, what translation. This Bible is uh, indispensable. Can you get it on Amazon? You, uh, you, I don't know. You can check. But again, netbible.org. Okay. It says, uh, for books, um, I go to eBay, which you don't find, but they're not brand new, and I'm just smoking through a bunch of yeah. eggs, so, and free shipping. Free shipping. So, I've got to be careful with that, though, because I, I have a netbible, and uh -huh. it doesn't have all the, the, the commentary in it. Ooh. Yeah, that's probably not the same one. Yeah, make sure it's Bible, it says Bible.org. Make sure that it's that one. Don't let it be a fake, because there could be other Bibles called Net Bible out there, but this is it, and NetBible.org is where you can get it. Like I said, it's only about 25 bucks, but it's well worth your money because it, uh, if you're just a, a basic Bible reader, probably won't do you much good, but if you really want to know the truth and why things are different and you want to, um, you, you, don't, you don't learn this stuff to get back at people and throw things in people's face. I didn't buy this to throw it at somebody. I bought this because I want to know the truth. And, you know, whether I share this with somebody, like with this gentleman, and they want to learn the truth or not, doesn't matter. But I want to know the truth myself. And I want to, you know, so this will put your mind at ease about why things are the way they are, okay? But for the most part, any Bible, really, any translation, except those message ones and stuff, is, is a good translation, all right? People ain't out there trying to smoke you. Um, they're not trying to deceive you. None of that kind of stuff. It's just all about readability. Now, let's talk a minute about study Bibles. How many have study Bibles? Right, several good things about study Bibles. Uh, first, uh, there, there's probably a limited concordance in the back of the Bible. And a, you know what a concordance, kind of like a dictionary. It'll have, uh, you want to look up a certain word like Paul or whatever, and you, not in most of your study Bibles, but... You want to look up uh, uh, Reformation, or no, because that's not really in the Bible. You want to look up uh, Lord, all right? You look in the back, Lord, and it'll give you all the different scriptures that you can find the word Lord in. Just small correspondences in there, because if you look Lord in a regular uh, concordance, there's going to be a thousand passages, all right? But what a concordance does is it takes a term or a word, and it gives you all these various occurrences throughout the, the Bible where you can find that same word at. But what it does is if I'm doing a study and I come across a specific word, like we, we like to throw uh, Christianese around, right? And we use words like justification, and we don't always even ourselves know what justification means. But what, what you do is you look that up in the back, and then that concordance will show you all the other places where that word justification is, and you can go and look at them and see what they all say about it. Now, at the end of the last session we had last fall, we had Pastor Mike come in here, and we actually uh, ended the course with him going through and, and having somebody pick a subject, and I think we picked baptism, uh, the last one we did, and, and showed how to use a concordance and to use different tools to look up what all the Bible has to say about baptism and make all these statements from the Bible and then come in and paraphrase all that into one paragraph about what does the Bible say about baptism. Correspondence or... Uh, Am I saying concordance is uh, really good to help you with that? So some study Bibles also have a an abbreviated cross-referencing system in the text itself. And if you look at your study Bible, it might be in a little column at the end of the page or on the side of the page there. And if you look at verse 13 and you look over to that little column, 
it give you some other passages of Scripture that associate with whatever, whatever verse it is that you're looking at. And, and what they're doing there is saying that this idea or term is used in the other, other places in the Bible also. So kind of like a mini, uh, and a more expanded version of a concordance. It give you some other areas to look at. Some Bible studies have study notes at the bottom of the page, and they'll give a sentence or two or even a paragraph of what a word means or a person is or a place. One of my favorite study Bibles, who we'll be talking about, uh, you know, some of these people study Bibles, they have their own biases in them. you got to be careful about. But one of my favorite ones is the Holman Study Bible. There really is no bias in that. It just has a lot of what, what some of the Greek uh, and Hebrew words mean and geographical, geographical maps and stuff like that. So there really is no bias in these. Because, again, the danger in some of these study Bibles is they're coming from a very specific theological viewpoint. All right, So you're getting their study notes... And their study notes are them trying to promote their viewpoints, so you kind of need to know their motivation behind what they're doing there. Any, any study Bible, right? I have a, also, we give most of the kids that I come across, we give them the uh, apologetic study Bible. I mean, obviously, some bias there. It's all about defending the Bible. So some study Bibles are going to have a section on subjects. And again, the apologetics Bible or the open Bible are examples of that. And at the beginning of the Bible, they give you a subject index. And if you want to like look things up about King David or whatever, it'll have a section talking about King David and give you all the passages you can go to about that. And almost all study Bibles have maps and, and articles. Um, there's so many different study Bibles out there that you know, it's, it's hard to... Uh, when somebody says, what kind of study Bible would you recommend? I don't know. What are you looking for? <laughs> you know, Because there's just about anything out there. But if you haven't used a study Bible... I would really recommend using one, but again, be very careful as, as far as what kind of study Bible you get because there are biases in them. Now, commentary notes. Some editions of Bible contain not only brief marginal notes, but they provide a running commentary. On the NIV, study Bible is, is pretty good with that. Uh, the other famous one is the Schofield Reference Bible or the New Schofield Reference Bible. And the main concern, again, with using these Bibles are uh, many people start thinking that that commentary is inspired, all right? And I, I know somebody in here who is actually dealing with that right now who believes that commentary is inspired. <laughs> and they, they, they see that commentary is inspired words, but man, th them are just man's personal comments and thoughts about that text. It's only the text that, that is inspired by God, Okay. But we, see, we read that so much and we take this as inspired and we start having these beliefs ourselves. And that's a danger, man. That's a danger. It's somebody else's words. Now, commentaries, which is what I have up here. Man, this is an indispensable tool if you are a student of the Bible. And without the use of these competent commentaries, I'm abusing the principle of private interpretation and relying on my own personal bias when I'm going through Scripture Right, and my judgment alone, because going through commentaries really produce a, a check and balance system against my own prejudices when I'm going through the scriptures. Now, I use commentaries a lot, but I don't use commentaries until I'm done uh, setting up my own, I set up foundations for whatever I preach and pick out the scriptures or what the topic, the main topic is going to be or what the main topic that is coming out of that text. And, and I'll go through what's the best commentary on the Bible, church? What's the best com commentary on the Bible? The Bible. I, I go to see what other scriptures say about the scripture and all this and that. Once I have my basis down, now I go to commentaries and find out what other theologians say about that text. All right? I have three, I think, main commentaries in my office. I have the whole set um, that I use, which are th really three different viewpoints um, because I, I, I don't just want to hear one person's thing that aligns with what I believe, but I want to hear it all. And then, of course, I get on, you know, online, too, and look at commentaries on there and stuff. But um, so many of these, uh, like I say, most of the commentaries that I have, they're uh, one book for each book of the Bible, basically, is what it is. You can get some commentaries, um, like, uh, oh, what's the old guy's name? Um, what's the old guy's name that does the nightly shows usually on? Jules Verne, or what's his name? Vernon McGee. Vernon McGee, like Vernon McGee. He's got like a two or three 
uh, volume series commentary on the whole Bible, and uh, there's some other, Jonathan Edwards has a, a one-volume commentary on the Bible, so there are some single commentary stuff out there. But, so they range from single volumes to masses of them on the whole Bible, and they're very technical works, and they're, they're, they're uh, provided for individual books, but they range from simple exposition to higher critical exegesis, which means doing what we do here on Sunday and going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter in the Bible. So again, other people's uh, you know, uh, mindsets about what the Bible says, but it's awesome to go to to check yourself against what other people say, other more learned people say, whether they're right or wrong. Um, Bible dictionaries. Anybody use Bible dictionaries? Now, I have some of these things up here, too, um, just for you to look at. But Holman and InterVarsity Press are really good ones. Uh, what a Bible dictionary is going to do is give you articles on each book of the Bible. It's going to tell you about people and places and things. You, you, in the Old Testament, you like this, come across this Nebuchadnezzar dude, like, who is this? Well, get a good Bible dictionary, and it'll give you a pretty good outline of what Nebuchadnezzar is. So uh, another example, you're, you, you come across this guy named Ehod in the Bible, right? Who in the heck is Ehod? <laughs> well, you can look him up, and the Bible dictionary will tell you all about Ehod. Uh, you might want to use it to find out where exactly a place is. You can uh, find articles on groups of people, such as uh, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes. Let me tell you something. It's hard to find material on the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. All right, I, I was on a quest for about six months trying to find material about these guys. Not a lot exists. I did find a 10-volume set on, on first century, uh, well, early, I, should, I don't even know how that operates, like the late B.C.'s, early A.D.'s type of stuff. And the Pharisees and Sadducees and stuff are, are part of that in there, but it's about the most competent stuff that I found about the Pharisees as far as uh, who they really they were. And, you know, because we hear about them all the time. Like, who were they? You know, what did they do? How did they come about? When did they die out? Are they still around? Uh, hard to find that kind of stuff. But you can find all basics in a good Bible dictionary or a Bible encyclopedia. Um, and, and again, you can go and look up that term justification or redemption or any of that kind of stuff, and it'll give you a really good outline about that kind of stuff. Concordances. What this does is takes a specific translation, and when you have the word that you're looking up, it will give you every single occurrence in that particular Bible of where that word shows up. And if, if you really get, get some good ones like Strong's Concordance, how many use, use concordances? Have a good concordance. Strong's Concordance, Vines. Strong's Vines, pretty much good for anything. But yeah, you look up the word inheritance. And this will give you every single verse that that word inheritance is found in in the Bible. So you look up any word in the Bible in this concordance and it'll show you all the other verses that it's in. So it's like a search, like a search engine, essentially? Pretty much, yep. yep. Uh, the other thing that it does is it keys every one of those occurrences with a number to a dictionary in the back which gives you the meaning of the original Hebrew or Greek word. Another uh, good thing for that is called a keyword study Bible. You can get these keyword study Bibles in whatever, uh, whatever version that you have, and it, and it gives you all these little numbers all right, for the original Greek and Hebrew, and you can look them up in the back of, of the, the book, and it'll by number system, and it'll tell you what that Greek or Hebrew word means and all the different meanings that it has. So excellent little... Uh, deal there. A lot of Bibles uh, do that. Um, that's pretty much it on that. So I'm going to show you a couple other things that I, I want you to be aware of. These are like the main things, the main tools. But if you're, if you're someone like Brian who likes to, you know, we were going through the, the tabernacle and, and Brian went out and did, it wasn't 90, it was like 19 hours or something that he spent on his own going through this tabernacle stuff and listening to podcasts. If you're someone like Brian, and you're, you're like me, I <laughs> like all the tools I can get, I, I soak up, I saturate God's Word, and I want to I know the stuff. I want to know the, the intent. I want to know the, the origin. One of the, uh, one of the tools that my, uh, my mentor told me about was this Bible background commentary. 
And what this does is it goes through the Bible from Old Testament. There's Old Testament one, there's a New Testament one. And it'll take you through verse and scripture uh, in this and tell you what was happening in, the, in that context in history during that time. Uh, so great historical thing called the Bible Background Commentary. Uh, John H. Walton, Victor Matthews, Mark, you can look at it okay. up here. Okay. Yep, and there's two of them. There's one. Yep. Uh, yeah, there you go. Another one of my favorite things, everybody have a Lexian? And basically what a Lexian is, this, this one is for the Greek and the New Testament. So again, uh, some, of these, some of these Bibles that I have, they have the key words. You can go back here, either the key word or if you know a little bit of Greek. Um, I'm, I'm trying to learn more Greek. I, I was pretty good at Hebrew because a lot of our rituals in the occult was Hebrew. We had some in Greek, but I knew a lot more Hebrew, and I knew the whole Hebrew alphabet. It's like, now I'm in the New Testament. Now i got to learn Greek? <laughs> but the more you know, the better it is, and, and it, it will just blow your mind. I mean, Greek is awesome, but this will go in here, and again, this is just more accuracy with the, with the Greek words in the New Testament. You can look them up and see what all this means, and it'll show you where all the occurrences are. Um, there's some even better Lexians that I have in there where you can, uh, uh, it, it gives you like the ultimate meaning of the word and all the different meanings and all that. This here it tries to keep it simple in the most basic words. Uh, any of you familiar with the Septuagint? This was the original Bible. Okay, it wasn't the King James Version. <laughs> this is what they used back in the first century. And this is actually the Greek Bible that they had. All right, and then it has the English translation next to it. But that's the Lexian or the LXX that you uh, might read about sometimes. Uh, and then there's interlinear Bibles, like Sister said here, going through various translations. You can get uh, interlinear Bibles, which means that there's more than one translation in a book. Like this one here is NASB and NIV together. Uh, so you have the original Greek. One side you have the NASB version. The other side you have... Uh, the NIV version. So you're getting it all. You're getting the original and you're getting these two versions of it. And you can get this in almost every version that's out there. And again, here's another keyword study Bible. This one is for the NIV, um, where the NIV Bible, and then you have uh, numbers by certain words. Some words are underlined and it gives you a number. You just go to the back and it'll either, for the Old Testament, give you the Hebrew, New Testament, give you the Greek and the, the, the meaning for those words. So it's all in one book. Not as uh, out there as far as giving you all the different meanings of that word, but gives you the basics. So a lot of different tools. And if, if any of you guys need help or you want to learn more about some different tools to use out there, please come to me and ask me. And I will show you. Because there's so much out there, but there's also a lot of garbage out there, too. And you don't want garbage. All right. So... Uh, Lastly, I have on there some uh, on your notes some software or online tools that you can use. <laughs> We're actually all this stuff here is online and a lot of it's free. Um, one I use on here, uh, logos.com and netbible.org. Um, I use those a lot in uh, putting my messages together because I have all that, all this basically available at my fingertips. Logos to cost money. Uh, so you probably don't want to go there, but most of this other stuff is all free. Um, so use that stuff. Uh, HebrewWordLesson.com, another great one. BibleHubPrecept.org, BibleProject.com. They're all great tools, and again, has most all this stuff available at your fingertips for free, so you don't have to buy the books and, and worry about any of that. And even though, I mean, if you're anything like me and you're not computer savvy, <laughs> and it takes you, I know what I know, that's about it. Um, but once you start using something and you get used to it, it gets a little easier. But most of these uh, software packages really make it easy uh, for you to do things. So that's the first session today. Uh, I went a little long. <laughs> Actually, I went a lot long. I was supposed to be done by 7.30. Um, so, Brian, can you, cut that? can you cut that off for me? Uh, so sorry for keeping you here later than I expected. Uh, this is, I'm trying to get people out of here by 7.30. I'm not going to go along next week like I did today, but today was pretty important.